So um, HubSpot or before, uh, one great thing, and you even said, um, started off with a freemium product that is now just the free CRM, perhaps. Um, yep. What did that process look like for you? So the process was really interesting for us because um, we it changed drastically over time. And we really started just by touching on what is freemium for HubSpot. Uh, oh, great. Woohoo! <laughs> Sorry about that. No, this is great. <laughs> We're agile. <laughs> um, so we started with just a, a freemium email tracking. And what we realized, we honestly iterated over that product many times. And that's where we really leveraged um, more the PMM or the product uh, marketing manager to work with the PM and develop what is product market fit and what is the product. And then myself and the sales leader really worked on determining where are the levers that we can pull to pull revenue once we, or even before that, how can we ensure that users are sus sustaining on our products and finding value? Um, so I really leveraged the PMM almost more as designing the car and then the growth marketer is the person that's upgrading the engine and pulling levers to either, whether it's either to increase user engagement or it's to increase revenue at the bottom of the funnel. Yeah, awesome. And Alexis, would you like to give your origin story, which I guess now is your intro, and then, I mean, you work on phenomenal products, and even in the past, um, you have a great background of B2C and B2B, so I'd love to kind of like paint the picture and the framework uh, about um, what your career has looked like. Definitely. Um, so I'm currently at Adobe, and I started Adobe on the B2B side of the business, which is our experience cloud, which is our ad tech and MarTech tools. Uh, started off on a product called Primetime, which is our digital video player that's backed with analytics as well as personalization tools. Uh, so basically giving traditional TV operators and programmers the ability to have an OTT, which is like over-the-top television type experience, so they can compete with like a Netflix and a Hulu and Amazon Prime Video. So that was the first tool that I worked on. Um, and then from there, I did product marketing for um, another kind of MarTech tool called a data management platform. Um, and we branded it as Audience Manager. And this was a product that essentially allows marketers to segment their audiences, uh, overlaying first, second, and third party data. So giving them the ability to have really um, insightful kind of activations using a DMP, a very competitive space. So during that time, I did a lot of competitive analysis and then came up with a strategy specifically for the media and entertainment sector and how a DMP can kind of solve some of those pain points that they're facing. Um, but from there, I went to the B2C side of the business and now I'm on the uh, creative cloud, which is all of our kind of like design and uh, creative tools, including Photoshop, uh, Premiere Pro, and I specifically worked on video. So I'm um, doing uh, launches of new products so I can talk to that. Um, from private beta to V1, um, and then this, to scaling that product. And um, yeah, excited to be here. I would actually like to fanboy for a second and say that <laughs> <laughs> I've used your products at multiple companies, and I don't think I would have a career without them. Nice. So like, first of all, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, because growth is such a big part of this panel, I would actually love to just throw it back at both of you, but you, Alexis, first, since you talked about competitive analysis, stuff like that. Um, what is growth marketing? Um, when I was at Kickstarter, for example, uh, we had a very narrow definition because of the business objectives. So we grew our um, email subscriber list from 13 million to 26 million. And I mean, a lot of them were just like, oh man, they would never buy the, like, give to a project right now. But that was fine by me because I was looking at the future growth with the user. But I understand there's different examples and different de definitions as well. So would you like to kick us off? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think it really depends on the type of product and what your initiatives and KPIs are in terms of growth, right? So if you're looking at growth from like a download rate, then you know what initiatives do you need to do to drive downloads? What initiatives do you need to uh, do to drive that conversion metric that you're looking at? Um, also, growth is in a, a sense of mind share. So you can grow in mind share from brand lift perspective perspective. And I think those are also very important. So I think when it comes to growth is really identifying what your metric for growth is, whether that's a revenue metric, whether it's a download metric, whether that's a customer adoption metric. Um, I think those are all things that have to stay in mind and be very clear on what that growth target is before you create any type of programming or any type of campaigns around it. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, the way that we structure ourselves internally is we almost have a growth marketer associated with 
um, each part of that actual funnel. So if we have a team that's focused on new user onboarding or acquisition of new users, we may have a growth marketer, or at least a percentage of their time associated with that task. And then it may be an entirely different person's job to work on the monetization of our user base or even upselling our existing customer base. And to, to your point, Alexis, it's really about just defining that metric and making sure that people stay really, really focused. Yeah, I, I actually often feel like I'm a growth marketer in a product marketer skin. And actually, you're a growth marketer, so maybe the other way around, and that's like yeah, how yeah. you feel. So given that we do growth um, marketing disciplines as product marketers and vice versa, um, how do you actually work with a growth marketer and how do you incorporate growth marketing into your strategy? I love you, passed it off. Oh, no, 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 no. Do you want me to take that first? I'll take that first. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, the way that I kind of alluded to this already, but the real way that um, that I see our, like, the best relationship with a PMM is centered on allowing them the freedom to develop what they believe is right for our user base with the PM, because you know at the core I see that as part of their of their job, and then I see really my job as almost adding fuel to the fire and assisting them in moving uh, core business metrics. So whether that's if it's top of the funnel, maybe it's user acquisition or activation, and if it's bottom of the funnel, it's, it's associated with revenue. So I see myself almost as the lighter fluid to the fire. Yeah, and to second that, I think there is a partnership there for sure. Um, often at Adobe, we use growth marketers to kind of really figure out how we can reach our initiatives. So again, like we may have certain uh, metrics like um, we need to grow X amount of our monthly active users. We need to, uh, monthly active users defined in this context as um, a, a user who goes into our app or goes into our platform once and then returns within 30 days. So that's how we uh, measure on um, Mao, and then we also measure on WOW, which is weekly active users. Um, so I may come to the growth team and I may say, so we have a goal of growing our Mao. Right now we have, you know, 40,000 users a month using it, um, but how can we get that to 250,000? So those are the numbers that we're playing on. Obviously, um, when you're in a smaller company, the 40,000 might be your metric. That might be a success for you. Um, you know, and when you're in a large scale company, um, those are even more, the number of Mao is going to be even more aggressive. And so I work with growth very hand in hand to create uh, testing, to create um, some type of analysis of what we're currently doing and how we can do better at that. So growth marketing is such an important part uh, to the whole, uh, the PMM ecosystem, I would say. You look like you're, did you want to chime in as well? I was just going to say, I think at, the, at its heart, what it is, is access to data. You know, um, if, if I don't have full data on the area of the funnel that I'm focused on, I'm really flying blind and my relationship with the PMM is not going to be that great because we don't know what we're, what we're chasing. Um, so at, at its core, it's access to data. Yeah, and actually there are a bunch of questions um, after the last session about relationship with the product manager. So kind of I'm going to translate that into like relationship with the growth marketer here. Um, when you're talking about Mao and other metrics, who sets those um, in the relationship? Is it, I'm assuming it's a collaboration of some sort, but um, how do you actually come to the eventual conclusion? Well, you know, it's actually more, and this, like I said, I can't speak to more of startup. And I know we have a lot of people here who work at startups and it might be different. Um, for us, we get that from an executive leadership level. So we have a number of products in our portfolio. And so um, we have our high performing products and we know what their models looks like. And then we have our newcomers, like some of the products I'm working on um, that are that are not legacy products. And so there is going to be a, a level of growth that's different than a Photoshop or a Premiere Pro um, when we're dealing with um, specifically my tool that I'm working on right now is um, called Dimension. On, and it's a 3D compositing tool. So you can essentially make 3D mock Backups and prototypes in our platform. And then the second product product is um, augmented reality. So you can take those files from the 3D compositor and bring them into real time. So it's an AR authoring tool as well. Um, so with these products, they're brand new. They're market expansion plays for Adobe. And so we are mile, we're not hold to the same mile that some other product would be. So um, but usually that's set by like the executive team, um, not neither by the the PMM or the, I mean, the head of product also has something to do with that. 
So the way that we, it's, it's similar to that. Um, we use our executive team and our operations team, um, but it's really kind of a core partnership between the PMs that are associated with those products um, and the head of growth um, to determine, you know, what do we think we can actually scale this to? Because, you know, our head of acquisition will say, you know, I'm all, I will only be able to get, let's say, 50,000 people to download this product next year. You know, we can pull that through the, less, the, the rest of the funnel. And from the growth side, we can look at that and say, okay, we believe we have these plays or potential plays for the year that we can pull through and, you know, optimize the flow, let's say, to monetization to X percent. Yeah. And actually, to your point, Alex, it's a great point that there's a very large difference between enterprise, startup, and everything in between. Um, one thing, one way we might be able to kind of like thread the needle is by talking about betas and private betas. That's something that both of you have worked on before. Um, so during those times, it kind of feels like it's a startup and the goals are similar, more similar to startups. So um, how do you actually, Sam, um, with the freemium product, if that's your example, yep. um, how did you actually set a roadmap and create a go-to-market? Yeah, it's a good question. So what we really, <laughs> did you think of that one? Uh, what, what we really focused on was just in-depth constant user interviews during that period. Um, and something that I personally hold to myself, and I think a lot of people at HubSpot holds to themselves as well, is spending time with our support team and our sales team. Um, so I try to always make time a few times a year to sit in with our support team and sit in with our sales team so I get a pulse of what our customers are thinking. But I think that's even more important during the beta um, because then it just leverages you later on to know what decisions you should make and optimizations that you think you should you might have even before you have um, you know, a true data set to make a decision. Yeah, I definitely think um, getting customer data is super important. I don't think you can build out a roadmap without having some level of qualitative data, qualitative interviews. What we used um, for both of the products is um, we'd go to trade shows, like we'd go to like VidCon or we'd go to Comic-Con or we would, um, when I was on the B2B side of the business, um, we'd go to Ad Week, you know, and we're talking to customers and we're constantly getting them to try our product while it's in private beta. Even before it's in private beta, we're trying to get that feedback. We use private beta to get feature feedback as well. So as we launch, we try to, what we did is series of launches. So, um, even within private beta, usually it's like private beta, then public beta, and then V1. But what we did is we did multiple launches within private beta just so that we could get iterations on how we were going to build out our roadmap. Because I think that um, what happens is the engineer team, the product team, we have a vision of how we think this should look or how it should work. Um, but getting that target market and understanding that target market fit, I think, is crucial when you're trying to build out the roadmap. So if you had missed the very, very, very beginning, because you were um, lucky enough to still be eating, getting coffee, um, I described the structure of this panel more like a sandwich. Uh, so I have one more question before we open up to Q&A, because Q&A was so great this morning. And again, if it's crickets, I have more questions, so don't worry. But um, this is your time to like really ideate and get ready. Um, so my next question is actually, given like private beta and so forth, um, <laughs> one of the, the first projects I worked on at IBM Watson was the um, the release of Watson Assistant within our enterprise software, and we very quickly jumped the gun past beta. And I have so many deep regrets. Please don't quote me, but so many deep regret, regrets about um, releasing it more slowly. So, what are actually common mistakes that you think about when working um, through growth metrics, as well as like a go to market that's growth driven? I'd say the number one, and to your point, um, you know, biz, we all have business objectives, um, and you may want to push a rollout, um, but pulling one back is ten times as hard as pushing one out. Um, and dealing with that with the user base is really, really tough, especially if it's you know a web app or something, and you're changing the UI, and this is something that somebody uses for their business. Um, you know, you're going to cause a lot of friction uh, in their job, and that's that's really dangerous. So. Um, I really push for slower rollouts um, and even we'll do like, you know, targeted demographics so that we at least we understand it within a confined ecosystem at a higher percentage. Um, so we may target like the EU um, for a particular rollout just based off of, you know, the engineering team is there. So if something breaks, you know, it's business hours, it will get fixed right away. Um, or if it's a feature that we build here in the U.S., then it would have a potentially a, a region of the U.S. rollout. 
Definitely. I think that was a great point. Um, I think, yeah, taking, like I said earlier, just having multiple kind of iterations on that private beta um, and taking it slow because my head of product was wanted very aggressive rollout. And so he wanted feedback. He wanted 5,000 applicants to like be part of it. And I was just like, look, <laughs> we're having a lot of bugs right now. We're having a lot of crashes. We still haven't even got our user voice set up, which is like our back end so that we can collect those uh, feedback from the customers. Um, things were not set up properly. Properly. And so I think when you have like the pressure of like executive leadership, it's like, hey, we need to get this out. We have goals. We need we have a deadline timeline. Um, that's when things get a little bit choppy. And I think that, you know, as product marketers, product managers, product owners, whatnot, we need to be able to say, hey, let's slow it down, like you said, and let's look at what we're doing and the experience that we're offering. Um, and that's something that I was big on is like, what is the customer experience that we're offering now? Because even though it's still in private beta, people talk, you know, and people will talk about, you know, the product. And if we don't get it right, it doesn't have to be perfect because private beta people know that there's going to be issues in the product. Um, but if you, you know, just push it out to like 5,000, 10,000 people um, too early, it's going to be, like you said, something that is going to be harder to pull back. And um, you're, going to you're going to be so stressed out that you're not going to even be able to collect the learnings that you're supposed to during that time. And and to add to that, um, well, I think one of the best things that we've done internally recently is moved our um, NPS or our NPS from our customers into our product and it's dynamic. And that actually pulls into um, individual Slack channels. So that actually allows each engineer that works on this that may not have customer interaction or maybe doesn't want to speak to a customer, they can still read that feedback. Um, and that I personally view that as my default Slack channel. So if I'm not talking to anyone, it's the customer NPS that is always on my screen. So throughout my day, I'm reading customer NPS responses. And I think that also keeps me in line with what people are thinking within the beta or even within our public products. Um, so I think it, it, I personally view it as something as a constant stream that, um, to keep an eye on. So the way that Q&A is structured is that we have a beautiful person who is running a mic around, and all you need to do is raise your hand. We have one. Oh, oh, look at this. Great. Love it. <laughs> hey there. When you're talking about betas and specifically MVPs, the V of the MVP, how do you all figure out what is viable and what is not? Do you have discussions with your product people with leadership, I think that's where we struggle with uh, what gets released via beta is, is this actually viable? It's not crashing, but is it, does it encompass all the things that this product really needs to do at a minimum? And do you guys have those discussions? What do those look like? All the time. So my short answer is uh, I lean, I skew towards the research side of product marketing and the UX side. So I am biased, but always feel like if there's a strong um, roadmap and um, research set with users, then it's a lot easier because viable essentially then is um, solving the tier one problems that the users absolutely need solved. Um, and then, so we, we have multiple tiers and for that reason, that's how we define MVP. Um, I, I, I second that. I also think from a, you know, a, a much smaller um, perspective, the way that we view it or have historically is, you know, look at it from a content, even from an SEO perspective. You know, what are people, uh, if it's, let's say it's a, a new feature or a new idea, what are people searching within this space? What's the actual traffic? Is there enough people to sustain the volume that you could say, okay, we could get 10% of signups a month, or uh, sorry, let's say, 50,000 signups a month at, at a conversion rate of 10%. And even if we monetized at 1%, you know, what does that very basic spreadsheet math look like? And if it's you know, viable, then, you know, a very, very um, early beta to understand, you know, can you get people through this conversion path? Are they ask, then are they asking for the natural features that you see as potentially being a premium feature in the future? Deliver those to those to those users for free, get them, see if they still sustain with your product, and then build out your monetization at the very end of the uh, portion, even you know at that launch, really. Because monetizations, you have a lot more levers you can pull, um, and the real hard part is getting people to stick around. Yeah, I basically second that point. Um, I think 
coming, looking at kind of what is the skeleton, what needs to be there, you know, the framework um, in order to um, solve the problem that you're looking to do. Um, I think that's kind of where you're when you're at that point when you can release it out to people and get feedback on it. Um, again, it doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles or be perfect, um, but it needs to at least have that framework. Otherwise, it's not ready. You know what I mean? Um, so I think once you've identified that and you're like, we, we can solve for this pain point and this is where we're going to start, um, that's where you can start building off of from there. Thank you. I uh, love it. Full notepad, legal pad. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I've got three questions, but I'll start with one. Um, earlier, um, we talked about having growth marketers aligned to like different parts of the funnel. How do you, do you have metrics for each part and do they roll up into one sort of overall growth metric and then how do you keep them aligned if there are different people working on different stages? It's a really good question um, and it's a hard one. Um, so I'm not gonna stand up, sit up here and say that we've mastered it because we haven't, but um, we do have individual teams assigned to um, like new user onboarding, let's say, um, and then an acquisition team um, and then a retention team and a monetization team. So each of those are almost like their own silos and they'll actually work with different parts of our core product org. Um, if we think we need a higher level level feature built to support um, the overall narrative of our platform, then you know that's a broader product discussion. But if it's something around, um, we think we can make a tweak within the UI to increase conversion rate or um, user NPS or monetization, then these kind of silo teams have the ability to make that decision on their own. Uh, and you know, of course, they work with those teams and let them know. But we have these kind of um, <laughs> these working relationships where we, we go into their code and we make changes as needed. Um, yeah, I think um, similar, similar setup as you. Um, I, I want to kind of I kind of get a sense of like, I guess the people in the room, um, when we did the little survey earlier, it seems like a lot of people are in startups. So I think that type of what we just explained, is it a higher level in terms of a larger organization? Um, and I think when you're in a startup type setting, you're doing a lot of that yourself as a product marketer. You're looking at retention, you're looking at the customer acquisition, you're looking at um, what you can do to measure that even in app and then also outside of app um, and what that experience is going to look like. So I think, you know, it depends on kind of, I, I say set realistic goals throughout all of that. Um, be conservative because again, if you're reporting this out to your CEO or to your executive team, you're going to need to have hit those goals, you know, otherwise, especially in that early stage, it may come off like, the, the product wasn't a good fit for the market. So it's important to be conservative, but also, you know, kind of really see if you can push that envelope a little bit and see if you can really m match those goals, if not beat them. So that's kind of where I see, but there, you know, there's going to be a different way that that's, that problem is solved depending on the size of the organization. Yeah, and when I was at Stack Overflow, for example, um, there was one of me, the product marketer, and there was one growth marketer, and we worked really well together. Um, so we really needed to think about it as a single baton handoff. Um, so her, her KPIs were getting people to the site, and my KPIs were from sign up down to all of the engagement, like, um, like, um, creating questions, answering questions, using badging, all that kind of stuff. So that was like a very clear delineation and it was ne it's not necessarily how it ought to happen, but it's how it really needed to happen with that size of an organization. Yeah, any way that we can help you with your problems. You have a pretty good sense of our background, backgrounds. Right. Uh, so I'm still a student and I'm, pardon me if this question is very uh, juvenile, but um, I'm, I'm, so I remember vaguely when uh, I'm an Instagram, avid Instagram user and how they were rolling out beta and they warned us that, you know, if you want to sign up to be a beta tester, you were, you are going to encounter problems. Um, I'm trying to understand in the scope of the products that you deal with, uh, where do you get, how do you, how do you broadcast that this particular feature is a beta feature? Or do you don't do that at all? Do you like kind of launch something and then probably see if the existing cust how existing customers are interacting with it? Or do you warn them and then I'm I'm trying to understand how you gain that acquisition? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'd say actually we do both. 
Um, so something that's a true growth experiment, we won't announce to the user because we want it to be we mm -hmm. want it to be a true test. Oh, no. um, and in which case, we don't even announce it. And the, the true subsets um, one sees A, one sees B. Um, when we I think of it as I guess more when we do a more bigger core feature rollout, mm -hmm. um, then we you know we give people that kind of notice. Um, right. Generally speaking, we invite our top tier users because those are usually the users that give us feedback, which is really the most valuable part of the beta. Um, and then we personally always give them a toggle um, in the UI when they're in a beta to switch back to the old version because we okay. know there's going to be bugs. We know that yeah. nothing, it's not going to be perfect on the first launch, but we still want them to be able to complete their day job. Got it. Thank you. I think a lot of what you need to think about, and totally correct me if you do it differently, but I think of them in stages. You have stealth, alpha, private, and then public. Um, and in those stages, there's completely different expectations. So we are constantly putting things in like stealth or alpha in that sense, and we hand reach, we hand pick users, reach out to them, and then they like they're just like the ones who are super excited. They're like, AI is cool. And we're like, okay, it's gonna break, but you're the ones like feeding it and training it. And they're totally okay with that. So I think that's also a little bit skewed more towards the enterprise where you have to be yeah. really careful with your users and what you change. On the freemium side, we have the liberty to say for a percentage of our net new signups, the, the entire signup experience or where they land or something is going to be entirely different. Um, and we just segment that to a very small percentage of our signups within a period of time to be safe, to understand how it um, how it performs, and then slowly increase that over time um, as, if the results are promising. Hey guys, I'm over here. I can't really see all of you. Um, so talking about beta, um, we do have customers that are super excited to get on beta. We also have customers that are super hesitant because they see that as not ready. Um, and our product teams kind of struggle to get enough people on beta, especially enterprise products for enterprise customers who just aren't ready for something to break. Um, but we need to know that, you know, we need to get them on the beta to do that research and see what works and what, what doesn't. So when you, how, like, how involved are you in getting those people on beta and how do you deal with getting the customers that you need, for example, enterprise customers for a specific feature when they're basically telling you, let me know when it's complete. Hey, Alexa. Oh, yeah, great. no, I think that's great. Yeah, I was I saying, know. I think that's also like a marketing challenge in a sense, because getting like customer stories, essentially, like getting them to vouch for these brand new cutting edge products, um, especially like when I was working on the, the experience cloud and the MarTech side, um, we the data management platform is something that not a lot of companies know, but it's like super powerful and super useful if you do and you and you are able to extract value from it. Um, so when we try to convince customers, you know, to like try to, you know, so we can get customer stories and basically market the product, um, it was it was often a challenge. I would love to kind of get a sense of like high level what your product does because um, there's ways to position it to customers that might be effective for you when you're trying to get them to try a beta. What, what is, can you give high level what your product does? Um, yeah, so we have a new product called Finder, um, and it's an interactive touch display where you can see a map of your workplace. You can tap a desk and book it within seconds, just ad hoc. So it's just a big screen that you can lay out on your workplace map. Yeah. There's like a lot of friction to actually become a beta user. Um, so the, f the big friction like right now is one, it's great for enterprise customers who have big maps that people uh -huh. can't navigate through. And then two is they need touch-enabled hardware. So it's like a huge, that's like a big step is, hey, you can try this, but do you have a touch-enabled screen that you can throw this on? when we're in beta. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, to that point, it's just reducing friction um, where you can, um, especially when it's a hardware friction. Um, and then also like proprietary data that you may need, like in the case I was mentioning, from these customers, that's where you're gonna get, you know, kind of, so you need to be able to figure out ways to like comfort them, to let them know, like especially pick customers who you know like trust and have loyalty to your brand um, and then try to get that those customers to be more inclined to test out your product for you. The other thing that's worked well for us was giving the, the end user, that admin, the ability to switch back. 
Um, so empowering the user to be able to say, uh, you know, for you to reach out and say, we believe this is going to increase table bookings by 5% because we've done this other testing and you can do a nice marketing campaign around that, but still empowering the admin to be able to say, hey, we want you to have the control to switch back based off your user feedback, but we, we want to hear from you because your ideas are going to be, you know, what changes this, this into production. Yeah, and like boiling down product marketing, we're in charge of the positioning and the messaging, and it differs based on the stage of the product. So it, we, it, we're making the product at a beta stage valuable enough in the user's eyes that they do want to sign up. And I mean, sometimes it's like a $20 gift card too, and that's what makes it valuable. But having that definition, and um, or I guess like the range of that definition, um, I think is the key to success. It's crazy how far an Amazon gift card goes. Oh, oh it's crazy. Please it's that. awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. One one more question. Here we go. <laughs> so Michael, you mentioned before, um, or you've mentioned a couple of times that like the given the toggle switch, right? Like being able to have users be able to switch back. Um, do you, how, how much do you track the usage of that? Because I'm thinking of that as something that we don't have with our application, but I've seen a lot in applications I use. Um, and it almost could be, I'm wondering if you use it at all for like, um, almost like a de facto user survey, right? Because what are the three or four things they were doing right before they decided, ah, take me back to the old, uh, the old version, right? As to supplement some more formal you know, user surveys or feedback mechanisms you might use? Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. So we do do that. Um, so pers internally, we use Amplitude. I'm actually a big Amplitude oh, fanboy. Yeah, I, I want to know yeah. more about that. We're thinking yeah. about going oh, with yeah. that. Yeah. I, I love it. I'll talk to anybody else. Okay. Amplitude. Anyways, okay. um, so we use... Yeah. So, so we'll track that, that switch, you know, as an amplitude event. Um, and then we can, I can easily pull um, a chart to see what are these people doing before they switch back or what are people doing to switch into the beta, right? You can go both ways with it. Um, and then we also internally use those amplitude events to power marketing emails. So if we see someone switch, then we can enable a PMM to send an automated email from that PMM to get that feedback, hopefully from a percentage of those users about why they're switching. Um, so we see it as a really core event, um, and we, we track it religiously for, within betas, for sure. Well, thank you. And thank you two for joining. Love, absolutely love the discussion. I hope that you had fun. We clearly had fun up here, too. Um, and so if you have any other questions for us, we'll be roaming. Um, I think that there's a break after this. Uh, no, we have... I lied. There is no break. There is no break. <laughs> But um, you can always reach out to us, and thank you for your time.